Now we're going to master vested and contingent interests as well as shifting versus springing executory interests. So first of all, all of the grantor's future interests are indefeasibly vested and all executory interests are contingent. So the challenge is really with the remainders um, of which there are four categories, indefeasibly vested remainders, which I'll put over here on this side. And then on the other side, I'll put the other three, which are vested remainders subject to partial divestment, vested remainders subject to complete divestment, and contingent remainders. So just for simplicity's sake, um, I'm going to call these three remainder types over here type two remainders, but don't ever say that on an exam or anything because it's just for simplicity. Uh, now, I've grouped these three together because type two remainders contain uncertainty um, and indefeasibly vested remainders, on the other hand, contain certainty, meaning that we know to whom an interest is going and that nothing can take that interest away. So indefeasibly vested remainders require that first we have at least one ascertainable beneficiary, um, second that we know who all the beneficiaries are, and third that there be no unsatisfied condition precedent. And so then on the flip side, what I'm calling type 2 remainders have either some unascertainable beneficiary or some unsatisfied condition precedent because by logic if it's not a an indefeasibly vested remainder then it will fall into the type 2 category. So taking all of this together I'm going to suggest a three-step analysis that you can just go through um, to help you figure out what type of remainder you have. So starting with step one, step one is always to ask yourself is this an indefeasibly vested remainder? And if it's not an indefeasibly vested remainder, then you know that it has to um, fall into the type two remainder category. So first, let's start with an example, uh, a simple example. O grants Blackacre to A for life and then to B. So we can see that we have at least one ascertainable beneficiary, B. And we also know who all of the beneficiaries are. Um, there are no potential future beneficiaries that might be popping up. Um, and finally, there are no unsatisfied condition precedents. So really, there's no uncertainty. You know who all the beneficiaries are. There's no uh, unsatisfied condition precedent. And so this is unquestionably an indefeasibly vested remainder. So how about Blackacre 2A for life, then to B, if B graduates from college before 25, otherwise to C. So here we have at least one ascertain ascertainable beneficiary, B. We know who all the potential beneficiaries are, um, but we still don't know if Blackacre will actually go to B because there's an unsatisfied condition precedent. So this is in fact a type two remainder because there's uncertainty. Now. If I had given you more information and I had told you B is 24 and has graduated from college, um, well then the condition precedent is satisfied. So the remainder would be an indefeasibly vested remainder because there's no uncertainty. So hopefully that all makes sense and we're ready to add another step to the analysis. So step two is uh, when you ask yourself is there the uncertain potential for more beneficiaries? If so, um, you have a vested remainder subject to partial divestment. This tells us what we have if the second requirement for indefeasibly vested remainders isn't met, that we know all the beneficiaries. So for example, 2A for life, then to the heirs of B. B has one child, C. So first, there's um, at least one ascertainable beneficiary, C, but we don't know for certain who all the beneficiaries are because B can always have more children. So C has a vested remainder subject to partial divestment because C might have to share um, with potential unascertainable beneficiaries. 2A for life, then to the heirs of B. 
Now here we can see right away that there's not even one ascertainable beneficiary. So it's definitely not an indefeasibly vested remainder because the first requirement for that is not met. Notice that the heirs of B might have to share depending on how many children B has. So the heirs of B have a vested remainder subject to partial divestment. Now the heirs of B also have something else um, which we can only figure out by adding our third step um, which is to ask, is there conditional language? And if there is conditional language, but if on the condition that, um, then it's a vested remainder subject to complete divestment. And if there's no such conditional language, then it's called a contingent remainder. So let's revisit 2A for life, then to the heirs of B. We know the heirs of B have a vested remainder subject to partial divestment. But note that the heirs also have a contingent remainder because there is no conditional language. So now let's, let's practice um, our three-step analysis um, all at once. And um, we're going to try O grants Blackacre to A for life, then to B, but if B is not yet alive or 21, then to C. So in the first step, we have at least one ascertainable beneficiary, B. Uh, there's no potential unknown beneficiaries, and there's an unsatisfied condition precedent. So we know in answer to the question, is this um, an indefeasibly vested remainder? It's not because of the unsatisfied condition precedent um, and the fact that the third requirement's not met. So this is a type two remainder. Second, uh, we already said that we know who all the potential beneficiaries are, so there's no vested remainder subject to, par to partial divestment. And in step three, um, there's conditional language, but if. So this is a vested remainder subject to complete divestment rather than a contingent remainder. The last thing that you need to note for estates and future interests is the difference between um, shifting and springing executory interests, which is one of the interests of the of the one of the future interests of the third party that we learned about. And a shifting executory interest is one that shifts from one third party to another third party who is not the grantor. So. O grants Blackacre 2A for life if she uses it for commercial purposes, 2C. So, so uh, C in this case has a shifting executory interest that is taken away from a third party A who is not the grantor O. And when an executory interest divests an interest in the grantor, then it's called a springing executory interest. So O grants Blackacre to A and her heirs when A graduates. So if this condition is met, if A graduates, then the, grant, the, grantor's o, uh, the grantor O's interest is actually cut short by a third party.